Hey, Michael Viewmaster Moreland here, and welcome to Galactic Inquiry. Coming up, 20-year MMORPG veteran Star Long talks about the challenge of creating persistent worlds. Nikki D'Angelo talks spaceships and space spear. Community memes, paint jobs, and more. Coming up right after this. Welcome to Galactic Inquiry, the weekly webcast where we feature you, the community of Star Citizens. Hey, a big shout out to our big patrons, amongst them Royce Love, Jeff Tun, Christoph Linden, Paul Grosskopf, and Sandman Zero, and of course many more. We couldn't create this show without your generous support. Hey, the Constellation and its variants are creating a big buzz this week. Cloud Imperium released this variance poster, teasing several new concepts of the multiplayer ship, and the long-awaited Constellation scale model went up for sale. Now, I remember when the prototype was floating around the CIG office for about a year ago, and Ben Lesnick expertly demonstrated its flight mode. Gamescom is like, I don't know, right now, and I'm not there. But that's okay, because we can all watch the live stream from Cologne! Although Cloud Imperium has been a bit quiet about what we may expect from the event, but that's okay, because we're all going to get some full cool stuff of some sort. Anyway, the live stream is scheduled for 3 p.m. Central Time today, 7 p.m. UTC. I'll be there, will you? Later in the show, longtime Memorial producer Star Long joins us to talk about persistent universes, but right now, here's the word of the week. Word of the week. The word of the week is space yeast. If you're into scavenger hunts, you might want to head out to the Nevada desert where some amateur rocket scientists have lost their barrel of dead yeast. As reported in Wired magazine, Ninkasi Brewing Company of Eugene, Oregon teamed up with the Civilian Space Exploration Team and Team Hybridine to launch some live yeast into space, bring it back to Earth, and then brew some beer with it. The yeast went up, the yeast came down, but unfortunately for all of humanity, the yeast was never found. In fact, there have been many attempts to achieve space beer, including launching kegs into rockets, sending pints up in balloons, and brewing beer in microgravity, which one company says is the same as space, but we respectfully disagree. But at least one Colorado sixth grader has done them all one better. As part of a National Science Earth and Space Education program, students from around the United States competed to perform microgravity experiments in space. 11-year-old Michael Bozianowski's mini brewery was scheduled to launch the ISS in December of last year. Now, it sounds like these folks are just having a lot of fun, but Bozianowski, who doesn't drink beer, explains the motivation is more serious than that. Alcohol, it seems, is a cheap way to purify water when your ship's supply has been contaminated. And now, here's the news. And more from the world of aerospace, for all you Marsophiles, lift your space beers to cheer the two-year anniversary of the Curiosity Mars mission on August 5th. Jeffrey Marlowe, along with virtuoso composer Austin Wintory, sent this video love letter to Curiosity, the ship and the feeling, as they put it, as the rover continues to make its way to its primary target, the 5.5-kilometer-high Mount Sharp. Curiosity is only 500 meters from the bedrock that makes up the base of the mountain, marking a whole new terrain for the nuclear-powered rover, which is expected to continue its exploration for many years to come. And if you're worrying about your retirement years are going to look, well, like sitting around in a McDonald's drinking coffee with your geezer friends twice a day, then worry no more. Apparently, a bunch of you will be seizing extraterrestrial space vehicles with your parts you scavenged off eBay and that old TV monitor you left in the attic 10 years ago. Now, maybe you can't make this stuff up, but Keith Cohen can. He and his team, with a tacit nod of approval from his former employer, NASA, took control of a decommissioned NASA satellite, the ISEE-3, on a first-ever crowd-funded interplanetary citizen science mission. Their goal? Opening up the fire hose of space data collection to the masses. The ISEE-3 was originally launched into space during the Carter administration. Even though its been, batteries have been dead for more than 20 years, most of the craft is powered by solar panels and continues to chatter away unanswered. Cohen reasoned it wouldn't take much to gather up the necessary materials to replicate the now defunct mission control equipment and talk back to the satellite. Solar weather data collected by satellite will continue to stream live at spacecraftforall.com slash live, and because it's a crowdfunded project, its data will be available immediately for anyone to see. 
Their hope is that citizen access to space data will enhance current research and help some bureaucratic industries like energy and infrastructure find new life. And yes, the team is bringing it all to you from their mission control room in a McDonald's, dubbed, you guessed it, McMoons. <laughs> Today, Nikki D'Angelo takes a moment to talk about the new Constellation variants and what might be coming next. Nikki? Thank you, Michael. It's always a pleasure to be able to present one of my news stories here on Galactic Inquiry. Well, the story today is going to be very short and simple. The new Starship model year is almost upon us. In fact, it should be upon us within a couple of days. This is the time of year between August and October where all the Starship companies are going to begin to bring out their 2945 variants. So what's coming out this year? Quite a lot but I was able to get a heads up on the first one of these ships to be announced. And that's gonna be the Constellation Variants. The Constellation has been one of the most popular selling ships for the last decade. When it came out, it instantly became a fan favorite. It's able to be a personal transport and carry a load of weapons for those people flying into lawless space or across the borderland worlds. They're going to find that this ship is able to more than just defend itself. It could outright almost take anything out of the sky. Well, it's being joined by a few variants this year. And this poster, which I acquired from an inside source, gives us a heads up on four of them. They are the Taurus, the Andromeda, the Aquila, and of course the Phoenix. And while I don't know what roles each one might play, I'm sure there are quite a few interesting tidbits there for us. Hey, Nikki, any idea what role each of the Constellation variants will serve? Why no, Mike, I'm not sure exactly what each one does, but from the looks of the Taurus, it's most likely the personal transport that's been expanded to haul a lot more. The other ones could be command and control, it could be something like a science vessel, or maybe even a personal luxury ship. We are not sure at this point. So any idea what else we might look forward to in the coming weeks? Well, other Starship companies are hard at work, and I think that any day now we should also be hearing things from Consolidated Outland and Aegis Dynamics on the further commitment of turning around old Aegis Avengers into new flyable ships. That should be something happening really soon. And of course, the Gladius, which went on pre-sale just a few months ago, is about ready to be released also. So very quickly over the next few weeks to month, we could have quite a number of new ships on the market. Thanks, Nikki. Uh, be sure to catch Nikki's show, Star Citizen Addicts Anonymous, on her Patreon channel at patreon.com slash batgirl. And that's your aerospace news. Yes, Captain Air Gap. We'll get right on it. Top priority. No time to be wasted. Yes, sir. It's a multiple unit auxiliary power failure. Captain, we're out of time. My calculations indicate we only have four minutes, 32 seconds before impact. Shouldn't you be working on your time warp calculations, Mr. Psock? I am. Bones, can you get us out? Of this. Damn it, Jim. I'm a brain surgeon, not a rocket scientist. No one implied that you should change professions, Doctor. It's simply a mathematical certainty. We are out of time. You must do it now. What the hell is the matter with you? Jim, do you hear how this man talks? Bones, please. All we're asking you to do is try. Just wake up. That's all you need to do. Just wake up. I'm sorry, Captain, but he leaves me no choice. At Galactic Inquiry, we're always looking for your creations, and here's what we found on the web this week. First up, now I always love real-world fan projects, and Wolfhelm's custom Star Citizen gaming desk certainly fits the bill. Now check out the conversion from a standard desk to cockpit mode, complete with well-designed HOTAS setup and keyboards positioned for maximum kill ratios. Next, Cloud Imperium recently released the M50 Racer and announced a paint-over contest with some sweet SATEC gear as a prize, and of course, the citizens responded. The submissions are spread all over the Star Citizen subreddit, but here's a collection of several of our favorites. In particular, I like the Dumpers Depot and the Star Wars X-Wing paint jobs, and <laughs> this submission from our old friend Disco Lando. Speaking of old friends, this just came in from someone we thought was, well, dead. 
<laughs> no need to acknowledge that as a miracle. Say so, that doesn't work in here. Sorry. We have to get going to Cologne. But how to get rid of this bounty hunter? Look over there! They're offering lifetime insurance again! Wait, what? Where? Damn you, Colonial Movers! Well, it's good to see Marcus and Sarzu are still alive and well. For now, anyway. Finally, we wanted to give a shout out to a longtime Star Citizen fan contributor, Lucas Gabriel, aka Dr. Huck, has been broadcasting his Star Citizen Hello. FM right, podcast to the verse since January of 2013 of from his base in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Now on its 68th episode with over 60 side videos, Dr. Hawk is a well-known voice in the community and is a well worth tuning into. Check out his YouTube channel and take a moment to support his Patreon crowdfunding campaign. And a big thanks to Wolfhelm, Colonial Movers, and Dr. Hawk. You're on this week's Fan Frequency. Earlier this week, 20-year Memorg veteran Star Long sat down to talk about the challenges of creating online persistent worlds and managing the unruly citizens that inhabit them. So you've got a big background in creating persistent worlds, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Great. But um, you started in a kind of different place uh, out of college. What's your, what's your background? Uh, so I actually got a degree in theater, doing lighting, set, sound design, a little bit of stage management. Mm -hmm. uh, took, uh, and that's what I thought I was going to do for live theater, a little bit of music. I uh, did lights for like my friends' bands in my spare time, but sure. you know, I was gonna have a career in doing live theater and decided to take like a year off and had some friends who lived in Austin. I saw this ad in a paper for like game testers wanted, which mm -hmm. I was sure was not real. I was convinced that this was gonna be like some UT psych experiment. I showed up and there's some guys in lab coats who's like, oh, this is the kind of person who would answer this ad. <laughs> uh, but no, it was a real job and it was at Origin Systems, uh, Richard Garion's studio mm -hmm. that had done Ultima and Wing Commander. And I was like, oh my God, this is real. And I played these games. And, and so I started testing and I was like, wow, this is great. Like this is, this is what I wanna do with my life. This is a job. Yeah, this is a real job. I can make money and I can eat. So uh, a particular game came along uh, through the swept through the office that sort of changed your opinion about what computer games would be. Doom had come out and the whole office started playing Doom Deathmatch. The, produ the productivity killer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like lots of people having to go through the office. Okay, like, let's stop playing now. Cause like we'd start at lunch and it would, what would have yeah. been a 20 minute session ended up. Anyway, so, and I was just amazed and excited by how unpredictable and exciting it was to play against other humans mm -hmm. versus what we could do with AI and scripted sequences and things mm -hmm. like that. And, uh, and so I came to this realization that, wow, social gaming, gaming as a group activity uh, is way more interesting to me. And so that's when I started uh, pitching to Richards, like, hey, we should do some sort of multiplayer gaming. And then we started talking about, well, Ultima was based on Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. You don't play Dungeons and Dragons alone. That's what was always played as a group. And sure. there were party members in Ultimas. And we started talking about, well, wouldn't it be awesome if your party member was another player? There's this new technology that we had not had before. World Wide Web was just coming into being. Yeah. In fact, Origin, our company, and our parent company, Electronic Arts, did not even have websites yet. Yep. Uh, and so the only way you were playing games was through services like AOL or CompuServe or Genie. Or just hacking away looking for FTP sites at Apple and other Microsoft places. Like or on your college mainframe. Right. Like mm -hmm. it, and and mm -hmm. so we were, we were pitching something pretty new, like to play over the internet, not go through one of these services. Mm -hmm. And we kept pitching it. Uh, so Richard so it was a hard it. sell apparently. Oh yeah, like the, the, the not, not only sort of conceptually of like, we think this World Wide Web is going to be a big thing, um, which it seems silly to say that now, but I mean, at the time, it's like, wow. Who knew? What do we do with this yeah. thing, this unwieldy thing, yeah. And there was a lot of invention that had to happen, like this whole idea of like, I, you know, neither Origin nor Electronic Arts even had servers at this point. Mm -hmm. So the idea that you would have a server that people would have to log into, well, even just having the concept of an account, right? like unless there was AOL, or CompuServe or one of those services, right. but the idea that you would have an account with a company, not one of these internet services. Not with your service provider that yeah. got you onto the net, yeah. That was a new thing. Okay. Uh, so we had to, you know, we were set, we set up servers in spare offices. We had to go like buy rental space like all around the world. Well, yeah, I was a, uh, Mark Rizzo did Mark a tour Rizzo. of the world setting up server farms around the world to support right. the game in the local regions. Well, and that was after we realized 
that we couldn't run the whole thing on one server. Because right. original sales predictions, when EA finally approved it after three attempts uh, of them, and they finally approved it, uh, you know, their sales forecast was like 30,000 lifetime. I remember that. And because they were basing it on the biggest virtual world to date, which was like Air Warrior right. on, on AOL. They're like, yeah, if they had about 30,000 people, you'll get about 30,000 people. <laughs> and then we had a sign up for the beta test and we realized when we signed up, when we started, the, when we were about to launch the beta test, that we had no way to get people the client to play the game because the client was too big to download. Because right. you have to remember, there was a, this we were talking about 14.4 modems at the time. And so we realized, oh, we don't have any budget for this. Okay, we'll charge people for shipping for the disc. The box, yeah. For the beta, oh, right. not the game. Uh -huh. So it was gonna cost you $5 to be in the beta. Yes, and, and that was kind of a first too. Oh yeah, I mean, this is insane. And so we had 50,000 people sign up within a week. And their original four guys was 30,000. And then we realized, oh, we might need more than one server. And so that's <laughs> when we started. So not only did we have to do it from a technical standpoint and infrastructure and go around setting up all these servers, yeah. but then we had decided, you know, for the sake of immersion, we should have a fictional construct right. to describe them. And you participated in this. Yes. Well, you and Raf Koster handed me this first concept of... The shards of the Gym of Immortality. The so, shards of the Gym of Immortality, right. So in <laughs> Ultima 1... Uh, there was this gem of immortality mm -hmm. that the wizard Mondain created, and at the end of it, you shatter it, yeah. and you defeat him. Right. And so our story was, oh, well, to make it work, he captured a version of the world inside of it, and when it shattered, we created a multiverse yes. of all these different shards, and that's how we could explain all the servers. Yeah. And now, shard is the industry term for servers, and, and even to the point where database programmers use that as a term for instancing a copy of a database. And I wonder how many of them realize where that came from. Most of them don't. Besides just the infrastructure of getting servers and accounts and proving a business model, mm -hmm. you also, now once you're on, up and running with this, the shards of Ultima Online, uh, you're challenged with creating a world that people will enjoy and, and not exploit too dangerously and and will be fun throughout. And so you've you learned a lot of lessons about maintaining a persistent world. Um, what were some of the first things that happened when you turned on that switch? Uh, well, uh, lots of uh, very good examples of uh, base human nature, I would say. <laughs> um, some of the very first things that happened, I mean, during the, I think this was actually the alpha test. So we turn on the servers, I log in, I'm standing by the docks uh, in the capital city, Britain. Uh, a female player logs in and a male player logs in, and then they say, would you like to cyber? Cyber. And, uh, and cyber, yeah. that term was the term uh, for cyber sex. Uh -huh. And so they run off into a building and they <laughs> type nasty messages. To that them. didn't take very long. No, I mean, this was within 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, oh, and by a week's time of having the servers open for this, uh, there was a prostitution ring on those same docks run by a game guy named Fly Guy who <laughs> took a musketeer's hat, which is, you know, the big hat with the feather. Looks like a zoot suit hat. Yeah, yeah. which is sort of a pimp hat uh -huh. and dyed it like a bright green and would charge you a gold piece to be with one of his ladies. And what was stunning to us was we had built this elaborate crafting system where you could be a blacksmith or a carpenter or, a you know, a, a tailor. Mm -hmm. And people were doing that, but... This guy had set up his business before any of them. He was making more money than any of them <laughs> at the world's oldest profession. I mean, so we had this <laughs> lightning fast recreation of the world's oldest profession. That whole joke happened in this world simulation yeah. right in front of our eyes. I mean, it was just, and that's when we, that and other things made us sort of realize that we're less game developers and more like running sort of a government like having to build, like pave the roads and set up the utilities mm -hmm. and, and pass the laws that can protect the people from each other. That was something that evolved too, because there was a lot of player griefing and, and PVP going on. Uh, how did you counter some of that? What were some of the me methods that you learned after you were up and running that you was like, oh, whoa, that's not working very, that's taking the fun out. What do we have to do? One of my favorite was that uh, the way we had set up the world, the, the towns were safe areas. So if you were in a town, there were guards that would protect you. The way the world works, it was a overhead view, mm -hmm. uh, 2D isometric. Uh, and so when you were outside of a building, there was a roof on it. And much like a dollhouse, when you walked inside the building, the roof would pop up. Right. And so you could see inside. Well, there was this split second when you were walking in the building before the roof popped up, where you couldn't quite see in the building yet. And we also had this concept of banks. 
So if you collected too much stuff, you could go store some of it in a bank. Mm -hmm. So the behavior, the loop that people would do is they'd go out and adventure and they'd collect a bunch of stuff and then they'd run as quickly as they could to the safe area of the town mm -hmm. and deposit their goods in the bank. So we also had this idea of teleport gates. Right. Well, some clever players put a teleport gate right inside the doorway of the bank. So in that split second that you couldn't see inside the bank before the roof popped off, you'd be teleported not, out, not to, you'd be running full of loot, running into the bank as fast as you could to deposit all this. All of a sudden, you walk through a teleporter, not the door of the bank. You're out in the middle of wo the woods with a pile of bodies around you <laughs> that are naked because they've been stripped of all their stuff. And you're like, what? Oh, God. And then you're dead. I mean, instantly you're dead. All your stuff is gone. And because you got teleported out of a safe area. Right. Into the woods. And so... To be attacked and killed. And, and so then, in, in, the, in the metaphor of, like, you have to pass a law. Right. Like, they didn't do anything wrong. They were just using the, the, the simulation. Mm -hmm. so, but we had to pass a law, which was really just a code change, sure. where it said when you went through one of these teleporters, that you had to get a confirmation that said... You're about to enter an unsafe area. Do you want to go through this teleporter? Right. And the, and then the economic side of it was just uh, unbelievable because we had built uh, a closed system. Mm -hmm. So we started out Ultima Online as a closed system in the sense that there was a finite number of resources, there was a finite amount of money, and that would allow us to control the rarity and the pricing of everything. Mm -hmm. And what it relied on was this concept of faucets and sinks. So things would come into the world through a faucet. Mm -hmm. So there would be uh, a tree generating wood or uh, a rock generating ore, mm -hmm. uh, and then players or a, a, a you know a monster that had loot on it, or uh, an animal that provided meat or skins right. or whatever. Anyway, so there's these faucets, and then you would collect that stuff, and then you would make things out of it, or you would trade it for, you would go to the shop and sell it for other things. Mm -hmm. And so, and the sink would be things like, I have to repair my armor, mm -hmm. which takes metal from the ore. Uh, and, and so it was this really, and then we had an ecology where grass would grow, rabbits would eat the grass, wolves would eat the rabbits, and so if you went out and killed all the rabbits, the wolves would start coming into town and attack people. It sounds great. Right, but uh, all of that, none of that worked. I mean, it, like within a day. And why? Uh, because the players did not behave like we wanted them to. <laughs> they did what they wanted to do, which is uh, they just hoarded everything. They amassed wealth. Well, first of all, they went out and killed anything they could see because there was stuff there. <laughs> There's, so I'm going to, so they wiped out everything and, and nothing could spawn fast enough because there was no, uh, unlike in the, well, even here where we have a real and present need to keep our planet from getting too hot mm -hmm. or starving to death because mm -hmm. we can't grow food. Even here, we mess it up. We're locusts. Right. And in, I mean, you can imagine that amped up like a thousand times mm -hmm. in this virtual world where like, well, I don't really have to eat, so what do I care if I wipe out every, <laughs> all the meat? Now I can't participate in the game. That's not fun. I quit. Exactly. And, and so you have to balance that economic control that you absolutely have to have. You need to be able to control mm -hmm. the economy. So to get into this hyperinflation and things become worthless, which happened as well. Because then and we turn happened on, in other games too. Yeah. Because then we were like, okay, well, we just got to turn on the faucets, mm -hmm. you know, and just like have an infinite number of things. Right. That compounded with people started learning how to duplicate things, like you, exploits in the server code mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that allowed them to make infinite numbers of, you know, coins or items and things like that, just collapsed the economy. Right. And, you know, so the solution to the depression, like the lack of goods of anywhere, then turned into hyperinflation and the economy <laughs> collapsed. And players invented their own currency at that point. They were using oh, shells, uh -huh. they were using telephone These were actual rooms. rare items, not just yeah, something these, you can... So it, these <laughs> super rare items that were actually rare, mm -hmm. uh, even rare items that were actually exploits of the system, like uh, water tiles that were dynamic that they could put in their backpack and fish out of. I mean, there was a, <laughs> like they were, so they're, they invented their own currency for a while until we could sort of fix things. Mm -hmm. um, and so the challenge now, the challenge is, and it's always been this way since then, is that you can't really build a completely closed system. Right. You have to periodically provide some sort of input into the system or people won't be able to get the basic things they need, like I need bullets for my gun or right. I need arrows for my bow. Well, we'll jump forward a few years. Okay. You've been doing this for 20 now. Uh, and now you're working on Shroud of the Avatar, again with Richard, mm -hmm. and um, you're kind of returning to this, this space of 
a virtual world with a, an economy and a persistent universe. How are you applying some of the lessons that you learned with Ultima Online with Shroud of the Avatar? Some of the solves that we're putting into place for a, a you know a player driven economy is one of the one of the things is uh, all the best items in the game are made by players. So interesting. So uh, a player who excels in their craft. Uh, can make the very best gear in the game, mm -hmm. better than anything the system will ever generate, except for like there's three items that are related to the plot, the, right. the narrative that's gonna sort of live on top of the sandbox. Well, how do you get them to unload those? I mean, what's the mechanism for that to enter the economy? Well, uh, so they can make them for themselves, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, they can also sell them to other players, so they mm -hmm. can set up a business to sell them to other players, but they can also sell them directly to the system. And when they to sell- To the bank, as it were. To right, the government. To, to an NPC shopkeeper, mm -hmm. which yep. is part of the, quote, government. Right. Uh, and uh, the example we like to give is, so um, when I'm starting out, or anytime I'm making weapons, I'll make like 20 long swords. Right. And those long swords will have my name on it, my maker's mark. It'll say, you know, long sword by Dark Star. Mm -hmm. And I'll make 20 of them. And I will go to the NPC and I'll, I'll sell 20 of them to right. the NPC. And he'll keep 10 and he'll stock his store with those 10 swords. And when you go to the shopkeep, when another player comes into that store and looks at the selection, he'll see your, I mean, he'll see long swords by Dark Star. Mm -hmm. uh, not just a generic long sword. Right. Uh, but then we'll take it sort of even a little bit further to what we call, you know, sort of the absurd extreme, which is he'll, that shopkeeper will take the other 10 swords and sell them to the game. Right. Uh, and from a narrative standpoint, he'll That's sell right. them to other adventurers. Right, right. And, that, and what that means is we now take those items and we use them as the loot that you find on creatures in the game. Interesting. That's so a way, interesting way to cycle that back into the system. Yeah, so instead of the system generating a long sword in the hand of the skeleton right. in the sewers beneath that shop, it's actually going to be one of the swords you made. So you have a chance that if you go into the sewer underneath the shop that you just sold it to, mm -hmm. the skeleton that you slay is going to be using one of your swords. Right. But have even you then, had a chance it's gonna, to test that yet? Yes, we are testing all of that because uh, the part we have not yet really gotten into is the details of the economy. So mm -hmm. we're not we're not having fixed you know, faucets and sinks, we're not uh, enforcing rarity of goods or, uh, you know, um, co associated costs and things like that. But we do are operating a persistent space. Uh, you are placing buildings down. You are playing with other players. Uh, you know, we have about 7,000 people in each release. Really banging away and they're all them. playing with each other all the time. Do you reset the clock every time? And we do reset. Anywhere? So right. we're, uh, with the goal being uh, end of year, Will enable persistence. Mm -hmm. Well, Star, I sure appreciate you coming here and sharing some of the, I'm not going to call it your expertise because there doesn't seem to be any experts no. in the field of game economics, yeah. but certainly your experience, uh, which is rather deep uh, considering your background with uh, a long number of persistent worlds. Thanks for coming in, man. My pleasure. Thanks. For all of you Shadow of the Avatar fans, I've got my challenge going. Do you have yours? We'll be releasing the 30-minute full-length version of our interview with Star Long sometime next week. So, big news, we're taking two weeks off, that's right, after 21 solid months of producing Wayman's Hangar, Cloud Imperium live streams, and now Galactic Inquiry, I'm taking a break. Carla, Dan, and I will be back with episode 9 of Galactic Inquiry on September 5th. Same time, same bat channel, look for us here. Hey, become a Patreon backer today and enjoy the benefits of supporting a show by and for the fans. And if you prefer to support the show with a one-off payment rather than being billed monthly, reach out at pledge at galacticinquiry.com. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, that way you'll get a ping each time we publish a new video. And keep in touch through your favorite social portals. Links to the Galactic Inquiry sites may be found on our website and in the YouTube description block below. This show belongs to the Star Citizen community, so be sure to give us your feedback on our Galactic Inquiry subreddit. And of course, the centerpiece of our show is fan creation. So if you have something cool to share, and send it in, and if it doesn't suck, we'll show it. And remember, we're listening. <laughs>